Um, Mark's going to talk about Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory's Sequoia uh, and its associated file system. Mark Stearman. Woo! That's all right. That's better. All right. That's me. Lab logo. Pretty exciting. Our template's kind of dull, so hopefully it won't put you to sleep too much. Um, <coughs> standard disclaimer. Uh, I work for the government. They let me say stuff. They won't back me up and take responsibility for anything I say, so freedom of speech, guys. Uh, this is a Sequoia platform. This slide's pretty old. Uh, it's probably been changed a few times over the last six years when we started thinking about Sequoia. Uh, we're aiming for a 20 petaflop compute platform, 96 racks. Uh, each ra rack has about 1,000 nodes in it. It's a Blue Gene Q system. Uh, we have a Blue Gene L, a bl Blue Gene P, so this is the follow on. Uh, 1.6 million cores. I think Brian said 1.5 yesterday, but you know it's rounding error, right? Uh, about 1.6 petabytes of memory. 768 I.O. nodes. Uh, they're all QDR InfiniBand. Uh, Blue Gene L was gigabit Ethernet. Blue Gene P, which is the Dawn system up there, uh, that was 10 gigabit Ethernet. And now we're going to QDR ID, so something new every day. And uh, Sequoia is going to be liquid cooled, which is a new adventure for us. You can see the picture in the upper right. Uh, you, you can barely see, but there's a whole bunch of uh, water pipe. It's a 16 inch diameter inlet. 750 gallons per minute flow that gets distributed to all these racks. Um, it's quite an engineering feat. Uh, and then you can see the first few racks that were delivered uh, in the bottom there. Um, on the diagram right in the middle, the big red stripe, uh, that's our Lustre InfiniBand and Ethernet SAN. Uh, here at Livermore, we pretty much mount everything globally. Uh, so all of our file systems that are six years old or just being integrated now will eventually be mounted uh, on all of our systems. So this is kind of the I.O. infrastructure. This is an old slide as well. Uh, we were giving this to people um, probably this time last year. Um, you can see uh, what our requirements were. We were looking for a 50 petabyte file system, 500 gigabytes a second minimum. Uh, our stretch goal was a terabyte a second. Uh, we knew it would be a QDR InfiniBand SAN, uh, and we knew that it had to integrate with our existing Ethernet infrastructure. We had a little bit over $20 million for the budget, uh, and that we split up across five procurements. Uh, most of that was the RAID hardware, the ID SAN. Um, at Livermore, we like to do things ourselves, build our own. So uh, we tend not to just buy from one single vendor like uh, HP or Oracle or somebody and have them do everything for us. We tend to promote the smaller businesses, try and get a little bit of everything best of breed in each area and integrate it ourselves. Uh, we had a phased bandwidth delivery. Uh, so we were hoping to get 10% of the bandwidth uh, in October. Uh, up to 50% December and get the remainder in uh, February. Uh, we had a lot of I.O. challenges. This is also an old slide. Um, Brian talked about ZFS a lot, so we'll kind of skip over a lot of that. Uh, the InfiniBand SAN, uh, that first bullet there, lack of tools and experiences in HPC SAN. We've had InfiniBand clusters for a long time, but they've all been MTI clusters, and the traffic on an MTI uh, interconnect is a lot different than what we're doing with a SAN. And our networking team is uh, a big, you know, 40 years of Cisco experience, Ethernet, 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 and trying to get them over to the IB area to maintain, you know, the different switches and the different technologies, um, understanding that you manage your network from an open SM rather than logging directly into the switch. Uh, it's a big thing for them to learn and, and grasp hold of. Uh, we also needed to bridge our existing Ethernet infrastructure. Uh, so we coined, well, I coined a, uh, an acronym called RELIC, which was Routing Ethernet Luster ID Cluster. Uh, we have about three of these RELIC clusters. It's basically some number of nodes that are just Luster routers. That's all they do. Uh, so they'll have an IB interconnect and then some number of 10 gigis to balance it. Uh, for a QDR ID, we usually balance it with four 10 gigis and just run LNET on it. That's the sole purpose of the node. Um, <coughs> and then the Sequoia I.O. nodes. Uh, the I.O. node to compute node ratio on Sequoia uh, is a factor of two less. So there's 128 compute nodes behind every I.O. node. Uh, Dawn and Blue Gene L was a 64 uh, compute node to I.O. node ratio. So there were some concerns there. And uh, previously, the luster performance on the I.O. nodes was not stellar. 
uh, Blue Janelle and Dawn were both kind of uh, not meeting up to the full uh, bandwidth of the internet. <coughs> uh, Brian already covered most of this yesterday, but it's in there for uh, completeness. Uh, the Lustre OSD work is a big deal, uh, trying to get uh, us to be able to s you know, use ZFS, and if you know, ButterFS pans out or some other new file system in the future, uh, we can just shove that in there. SMP checksum performance, uh, ZFS optimization, and uh, quotas are a big deal for us. We don't uh, enforce quotas, but we do use them for reporting uh, so that we know uh, which users are our top users. If we have to go and purge, we like to ask them to clean up first uh, since it's usually faster than us trying to purge. Uh, so quotas are a big deal for us. <coughs> this was our SAN architecture design. Uh, in the middle, we have two 648-port QBR InfiniBand switches. Uh, the OSS nodes, since they don't have to talk to each other, are basically split in half. Uh, half would be on one switch, half on the other. The Sequoia I.O. nodes, since they're the clients, they need to talk to all the OSS nodes. Those go through some release switches. And we've two to one oversubscribed those for the same reason I mentioned before. Usually, they don't perform at a full uh, bandwidth for the network. So we figure we'll put two in there and see how it works. And then uh, on the right, you can see the TLCC2 and C Relic. Uh, you know, that's basically our existing Ethernet infrastructure. Um, so the C Relic cluster will be there. It's uh, 32 nodes uh, that each have a QDR and, and four TNGVs. So procurement status, uh, everything's done. Um, RAID hardware was award awarded to NetApp via IAS, a uh, small business reseller. Uh, the SAN InfiniBand hardware was Mellanox equipment awarded to Advanced HPC. Uh, we got our OSS nodes from APRO. Uh, APRO is the provider of the TLCC2 clusters. Uh, it's a tri-lab capacity cluster procurement that uh, Sandia, Los Alamos, and Livermore all run. Uh, so we took advantage of that. The MDS is a pair of Supermicro Westmere nodes, and we purchased JVOD and uh, some OCZ SSDs from uh, Raid Inc. And then uh, all the racks for Sequoia are on site now. They're being integrated. Uh, it's all in progress. So, build your own. <coughs> RAID hardware details. Uh, there's a box out there in the hallway if you guys haven't seen it. It's uh, a NetApp E5400. Uh, it's a QBA enclosure. We bought uh, three terabyte Airline SAS drives, um, 130 terabytes of uh, RAID 6 capacity. Uh, you can get them in fiber channel or InfiniBand. We chose uh, InfiniBand interfaces. <coughs> the OSS technology we chose uh, leveraged the TLCC2 work that uh, had been done. So we bought these APRO green blades. They're uh, a Sandy Bridge chipset. Uh, the blade has a, a QDR port down on the motherboard. We're using that for the LNET network. And there's a dual port QDR card that we connect up to the storage. Being able to leverage all the work that was done picking out a node makes it easier on us. We don't have to redo all that work. And it makes it much easier for things like spare parts and uh, maintenance. And the MDS stats are there, uh, 40. Uh, SSDs uh, configured as a failover pair, active, passive. We haven't done that before in the past, so we're experimenting with that uh, for Sequoia. Uh, the OSS connectivity, we basically have a pair of nodes connected up to this uh, E5400 uh, RBOD. Um, there'll be, there's 60 drives, so it's six, eight plus two RAID six configurations, three LUNs per node, um, active, active, failover. Um, pretty standard configuration. This worked out pretty well. Uh, we got eight of those uh, RBODs in a rack. We call it a rack storage scalable unit. Um, we put 16 OSS nodes in the top of that, so you get the nice two to one ratio. 48 racks total, 384 uh, RBODs, and 768 OSS nodes, which happily matches the 768 IO nodes on Sequoia. And there's a picture of it. Um, before I go to performance, actually, there's one more thing I want to talk about this. Um, in the past, we've, uh, when you get a few systems in, everybody knows you've got to configure your uh, RAID controllers with some sort of IP address so you can manage them, log into them, monitor them. Um, typically, that's connect up a serial port, give it an IP address, and then log into it, do your configurations. That works fine for four or five, six, maybe eight RAID controllers. When you get to 48, and it's really loud in the machine room, and you know it's a hostile environment in there, 
Uh, we had four Robert Dilmore and some of our operations folks out there um, for the first phase that came in. And you know, we probably spent about three days moving serial ports from each RAID controller, right? 300 or so RAID controllers all at a time. And it took a long time. We used this Centristi GUI to load up the configurations on the RAID controllers. That took another few days. So we learned a lot from that. NetApp learned a lot from that. So they came back uh, for this third phase with a large-scale deployment utility. Uh, it's basically a Java uh, application that you can, uh, they scanned all of the uh, RBODs as they racked them up uh, with a barcode scanner, put that into a, a CSV file, and uh, we DHCP booted all of the uh, RBODs into a dummy subnet, and then scanned the subnet. It connected to the controller, matched up the uh, serial number on the controller with what was in the CSV file. Took about uh, five minutes to configure 14 racks worth of storage. Um, then we used their, uh, the Centricity CLI instead of the GUI and just ran through a serial loop to uh, load the configuration on each one of those. That took about two hours, but you know, we launched it, walked away, came back the next morning. It takes about you know, 30 hours to initialize all the drives, so you know, what's two hours? You know. But it was a lot better than uh, you know, five days spent inside a machine room with serial cables. So you know, there's a lot of learning going on, which is good. Performance. Uh, we had two uh, performance characteristics we put in our RFP. We wrote the RFP last uh, July and awarded it shortly after. Um, so we didn't have ZFS working. We didn't have a good benchmark that we could give to somebody and say, yeah, put a Lustre file system with all the OSD work and, and ZFS on it. So we had them run ZPIOS numbers and we had them run XDD numbers. And we focused mostly on the, the one meg random sequential reads and the four meg random sequential writes, which we thought would be indicative of, of what our workload would probably be like. Um, so when I was going through running the tests and looking at the one meg random reads, I noticed this discrepancy in this wide uh, standard deviation. Uh, and the most of them that all came in in the first couple phases actually performed where we expected them. But then there were these little outliers that were way, way below everybody else. And they happened to line up with racks. And if you look at all those, those were the racks that came in in phase three. So we started looking at them, looking at firmware levels, and discovered that everything in phase two were Seagate drives. And everything in phase three were a mixture of Seagate and Hitachi drives. And the Hitachi drives were not performing as well as the Seagate drives. So we worked with NetApp, we talked with them, decided how they wanted to go about this. It was uh, on the order of about 4,000 drives out of 23,000. So we talked with them, we said, you know, we can work to adjust the Hitachi firmware, bring the Hitachi drives up to the Seagate level, or we can swap out all the drives. And after many, many discussions, small armies on con calls, uh, NetApp decided they wanted to swap the drives out. So we said, great, we'll do that. So we swapped them out. And you can see, okay, the Seagate's in there, everything is a nice, even, I think the standard deviation on this is like five megabytes a second on a, on a node, and this node's running XDD to all three lungs. So the gaps you'll see in here are actually now because uh, we have a small ZFS file system out there, so I didn't get to run numbers on those. Um, small being about eight racks, it's uh, nine petabytes. That's what we're testing with right now. Uh, and the gap in the middle was uh, one rack that was uh, sent to Rochester uh, to work with IBM uh, for some early testing uh, for the BlueGNQ system. The writes were interesting also because the Hitachi drives actually write a little better than the Seagate drives. Um, but there is a lot more variability. There's a lot more jitter on the Hitachi drives than there is on the Seagate drives. Um, turns out, uh, in parallel with swapping the drives, NetApp has uh, been working on the firmware, and they've actually gotten the Hitachi drives to perform better than the Seagate drives. Um, and you can corner them about all the details of that. Um, but things are working good. We're happy. You can see now the writes are also nice and tight. The outliers on there, uh, some of those are drive rebuilds that are going on at the time. Uh, others are uh, uh, incorrect bio settings in the OSS nodes. Um, if you have the, the power saving technology turned on, you happen to get pretty bad I.O. rates. So imagine that. 
Uh, and ZPIOS results are very similar. You can see those same kind of dips down on the blue uh, for the reads. Um, the read rates uh, for ZPIOS are actually better than we expected based on uh, the RFP. Um, but we can still see that problem with the, the Hitachi drive. Um, after the fact, everything's a nice, even performance. So we're seeing a little over a gigabyte per second on the reads and uh, about 1.2, 1.3 uh, in ZPIOS memory. So things are looking pretty good. Projected, uh, if you add in all the nodes, we s think we'd get about 920 or so gigabytes a second on the file system. Um, but we'll find out hopefully in a few months once we get uh, a full ZFS file system on there. And last thing, I have a movie if you guys want to watch it. I don't know how to hit play on it.